um, Mike Stringfellow here. Do you want to start now? Pakagagi Housing Trust. Welcome. On the right, that one? Is that the button on the right? Thank you. Hello, I'm Keith Johnston. Kia ora tato. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the uh, Pakakariki Housing Trust. Mike Stringfellow is our um, coordinator. Um, and I will be very brief. Our, the, the, the thrust of our submission is to encourage the council to be an enabler of affordable and social housing in our community. And we stress the word enabler. You don't have to be the biggest landlord in the district. Um, you can just help this to happen. Um, and so we, we are highly supportive of the council taking a greater role in housing. Uh, we would encourage you to go faster. Um, it's an urgent uh, crisis that we face in, our, in the community, in Paikakariki, but also in the wider community. We want to encourage you to focus on affordable housing, to focus on the needs of older people, to look for partners, not just ourselves, but organisations like DWELL, the Wellington uh, Social Housing Organisation, the Ngāti Toa um, uh, Housing uh, organ Organisation, Te Ahuru Mowai, and to, to look at what you can do with enabling the provision of greater uh, land becoming available for housing, the provision of services to that land, and to look at the district plan to make it more... Uh, housing friendly, particularly in the application of the national policy statement on urban development. That's the summary. Very keen, happy to take questions. Councillor McCann. Oh, you, you haven't pressed it. There he is, Michael Mayer. Three Mr. Mayor, it is very hard to um, criticise or ask you any questions when it's a, a thorough contribution and we're, I think we're singing from the same page. There is something, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you would have picked this up in the community, and this is my question, that some people have confused the idea that council playing a larger role is just going to be a housing developer, because uh, it certainly isn't something that council laws have been saying. I, um, I, think, I, think, I think that fear exists in the council that to step to step in and and at the at the senior staff level as well as at the the council level historically there has been a fear that to step into something like housing is to go back to the social housing provision that occurred in the 1960s and 70s and it sounds expensive it sounds complicated it sounds like a whole set of assets that you're going to get landed with and so as a consequence i think there has been a reluctance and a slowness by this council to step into looking creatively at what the po possibilities are. And I, I certainly think that we've been looking creatively at all of those opportunities and, and where we are looking at perhaps uh, more of a developing role is to ensure that there are some examples of uh, housing which is affordable and dense density is increased. Um, would, you, would you see a role there for council to try and um, have those examples so that other developers can follow because I'm sure you're aware that there really is a lack of uh, higher density housing which often goes hand in hand with affordability. Yes and so, so yes I think you can play in what you might call an exemplary role you know the provider of examples but you can do that in partnerships with, with um, other housing providers uh, and I think um, there, there is a concern about um, increased density uh, and the and the urban um, the the national policy statement on urban development will push councils around the country either quickly or slowly into greater density developments, particularly around transport hubs. Um, and so, where we've got an interest in what's possible in Paikakariki, uh, and we'd like to be very much involved in that with the community board and, and the community as a whole, that also as we stand here behind me, you know, there is this, around this hub of the Paraparaumu railway station, for example, 
in, across the, the wasteland that is the Coastlands car park, um, you know, there, is, uh, there, there are all sorts of possibilities there for what would be both commercial and residential developments that would be good for the community and actually good for having a core to this community where people live and also work. And, and so I think there's a way, I think there's a, quite a lot of rethinking to be done about what, what, is the, what, what does the plan enable and how does it actually make things more difficult? And on that matter, are you aware that we uh, will be starting consultation about our growth strategies in the near future, which includes all of those things that you've just been mentioning about density? That, that's wonderful. And what can we, uh, to come back to your point, what, what can we do about creating examples quickly while that consultation is going on? Because one of the risks we have is we will consult and there'll be lots of raru raru and excitement about that and then that will take time and we will you know, build lots of reports but we won't actually be able to keep people warm and dry with those. Oh. So, so I take it from that that you feel uh, that there is a real need for urgency for us to make sure that we're not just talking and doing endless reports that we actually absolutely make a change. A, a kind of two two track strategy. You have to do the consultation. We have to kind of change. It, you know, we have to have pro, due process and changing rules and pro, so forth. But at the same time, you can be encouraging some uh, um, special activities to start with, also to demonstrate what's possible. Um, and can I just add one? In, in our case, in Paikakariki, one of the things we'd like to be able to move on more quickly is accessory dwellings. Um, you know, the, 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 the constraints are, 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 are quite tight on accessory dwellings, and we think that they create an opportunity within the character of our community to enable a greater diversity of housing solutions. Yeah, thank you for that, and that was brought up the other day as well, so yeah. good to hear you repeating that. I'll, I'll be quiet now because uh, Councillor Halliday has a question. Councillor Halliday. One thing to that is people are being forced out of Pycock Ricky all the time. We come across instances weekly, monthly, of people being forced out. They can't afford to stay there. The ex best one of the examples is uh, there's an older lady across the road. She's just had a fall. She's got a big house on a relatively big section. But it, she couldn't build an accessory dwelling under the current rules there, a two bedroom property, to live on. She has to move out of Paikokariki. That's the sort of examples we're talking about. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I guess um, actually got accessory dwellings written down here, which I was going to uh, talk to you about. Um, but we've just had Paikokariki uh, school here, um, and we've had some of the kids just talking about friends who have moved out of the district. So. You know, just putting what you're saying, you would consider that pretty much would be about the last hanging fruit we've got with regards to being able to do something maybe quickly. Yes, I, I mean, I think that there's a few other low hanging fruit around um, uh, sort of involve looking at what assets we already got, involving um, community providers and some of those. There's some other possibilities to develop, but that seems to be one of the, the first. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Handput. Kia ora korua, and thank you so much for the mahi you do and pakakiriki for all of us and for the district as a whole actually in providing and bringing these solutions to the fore and also the urgency. Um, you speak about that so articulately, both of you, so thank you. Um, just following on from what Councillor Halliday has talked about in terms of the pakakiriki school students coming in today as well to speak with us, a lot of them spoke about housing and the need, especially in pakakiriki. So I'm wondering. Um, if you see there to be scope for the Pakikiriki Housing Trust to even have some conversations with the Tamariki at the school um, about their kind of vision for, for housing in Pakikiriki and their ideas for lowering house prices and ensuring that people stay in Pakikiriki. Uh, I mean, we'd love to do that, and we're very keen to do that. And, and I think uh, the other thing I'd sort of raise, and I've obviously I'm, I'm, some of you will know I'm involved in the Wainui Whenua project, um, there is some flat land that will become available through the surplus land after the completion of Transmission Gully that does have housing potential. There are some issues to be worked out about both in terms of water supply and, and, and stormwater imp and impacts on those ecosystems. There's, there's work to, that needs to be done there. But there, there is a, the, the, the biggest opportunity to change um, 
to, to retain the kind of diversity that exists in the Paikakariki community, the two opportunities. One is this extra land that would become available and, and, and it's used for housing through the Wainui Whenua uh, uh, lands, uh, the Transmission Gully lands. It's about, there's probably about 20 hectares that, that of, of flat, flattish land near the village that's available. And that's one, and then the other one is the accessory dwellings. But uh, both those two uh, would change both the viability of the and, and diversity of the community, retain the diversity in the community, because that's one of the things that we worry about with increasing house prices, the loss of diversity. But also they um, they they enable the school to become a much more sustainable, longer term um, proposition, and and they make the community. A, a more commercially uh, viable location as well. Uh, so, so there's a there's, it's a package of things that are that are required. Uh, and but we shouldn't be in, uh, overwhelmed by the package. We just need to start chewing and sort of chew them bit by bit. Right. There doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, your time. Submission. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Um, the next submit uh, safe Kabri Airport is Marcel, isn't it? Yep. Uh, Kira Tato, uh, Mia Guru, and councillors and, and team. Uh, I'm Marcel van den Assem. I'm here on, in a personal capacity, but also as part of the Safe Kabri Airport team. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the case to not just simply save the airport, but to stay, sustain the airport as a valuable strategic community asset. Um, look, I've been around for a while, so I do appreciate in the uh, commercial imperative of the of the current owners, uh, but also importantly, I acknowledge the rights of Tangata Whenua as original owners. Um, retaining the airport, in my view, and resolving past wrongs are not mutually exclusive. So I see that as part of a uh, of a of, of a sustainable and, and, and aspirational vision. Uh, as a strategic asset, you know, it serves multiple purposes. That's always a challenge when you have an asset of this nature. Everybody has a lens on it that independently doesn't necessarily add up, but collectively you know, becomes compelling, you know, whether it be you know, Medivac or disaster recovery for civil defence, uh, the passenger transport that we see today, um, or aero club operations, but also the open space and some of the sites of cultural significance. There's support there, but a lot of different dimensions. Uh, as a strategic asset, uh, I think most more importantly, you know, from my perspective, uh, is what it enables by way of future opportunities, uh, you know, such as connecting regions via electric aircraft. And this is not a pipe dream. You know, these aircraft are here today in New Zealand. We're, we're a leader, we're building on the space, uh, the space race, if you like, in the space industry. We have uh, aircraft down at Takapo. We've got an airframe business in Wellington. Alternative airframes, yeah, we'd love to see that sort of business hosted up here in uh, in Kapiti. Uh, point to point, you know, air travel you know, is the future, particularly with geographies like New Zealand. It's very hard to, to get you know, from Kapiti to, to Masterton. And uh, with uh, the future of avionics uh, and aviation, um, cleaner travel, more sustainable travel, you know, more simple connection between regions for a country of our, uh, our shape and size. Uh, alongside the aircraft, avionics is also opening up you know, a raft of opportunities in uh, sectors that we'd all be familiar with in, in the agricultural space, agri-tech, med-tech, conservation. Uh, avionics is being applied to deliver aerial insights uh, to envisage you know, avionics business businesses being spawned from, uh, from Kapiti, you know, using the airport you know, to provide you know, services to customers up and down the coast, and then building ancillary industries, not just uh, airframe and uh, and air, air, air engine you know, businesses, but you know, businesses right through to artificial intelligence, uh, using that data, you know, graining insights from that data. Um, and I've seen these projects uh, you know, ranging from you know, crop health, you know, insight right through to indigenous you know, biodiversity and, uh, and identifying uh, you know, uh, natural medication you know, from uh, very fairly dense uh, scrubland. And these are, you know, these, you know, this future is in line with where the government, you know, sees New Zealand. You know, higher productivity, leveraging deep tech, you know, being more innovative, uh, increasing productivity. Um, but beyond the airport, uh, and noting that the airport, there'd be different measures applied, but the airport is, you know, uh, is less than half of the, the, the land space. Um, 
the minimum viable airport there. The opportunity exists to develop contemporary uh, housing, medium density housing. We just had a discussion around social housing. Uh, opportunity for the restoration of wetlands, you know, connecting open spaces, you know, opportunity for government hubs, uh, commercial business precinct. Um, I'd really encourage an holistic view you know, of, of, of the asset. Um, and this asset would create uh, economic, social and environmental value. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons people would come to Capity. It becomes part of our differentiated proposition, if you like, it's a competitive world. Uh, and paradoxically, if we build houses, uh, then we run the risk of, of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, attracting people because of the transport infrastructure and then potentially uh, destroying it. So I, I think you know, the asset needs to be looked at holistically, as I've said, not cherry-picked. You know, airports are generally not economically viable uh, from landing fees only, so we've got to step back and take a, a broader view. Uh, the community has been consistently in favour of retaining the airport, uh, and I believe 85% you know, plus serves as a mandate that compels us to respond, and that's why I've responded, and certainly would like to see the council respond by owning a process that delivers that outcome. Uh, there are various mechanisms, uh, council-owned operation or organisations being uh, mooted, some sort of joint venture between local, central government, HAPU uh, and investors is a possible structure, but ultimately it's about collaborating for partnership and uh, collective uh, success. Uh, I'm involved in startups, uh, heavily involved in growth companies um, as an early stage investor and director. You know, more of these uh, ventures are being impact led. It's not just about financial returns; it's about making a difference. Um, and you know, we, you know, we're leading you know, globally in, uh, in in some of this trend, and particularly you know, the assets that we have um, that range from our innovative sort of can-do attitude right through to the uh, Maori DNA that's fundamental to Aotearoa Inc. are uh, underpinning these initiatives. Um, so as I said, investment's being channelled towards impact. I think uh, sustaining the airport, in my view, is, is the greatest impact opportunity we have on the coast. So let's not trade off uh, this potential outcome against uh, short-term gain. Thank you for your time. Questions? Councillor Randall. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, my question, just around some minor points. Your, is, your name is not Cl Clint Smith, is it? No, it isn't. No, he made the booking on my behalf. <laughs> OK, Thank you. I'm just clarifying this. <laughs> yeah. Number two, the letter is actually signed by members, two people from the Preservation Society, and a society would be a registered body. Yes, it is, yeah. OK, but the heading is the, um, it's called the Save... Save Capity Airport. Yeah, so is that a different organisation? So no, I'm, a, I'm confused about all the yeah, different organisations. Same organisation. So Save Capity Airport is the public, you know, call it the brand, you know, the, the simple uh, uh, re representation of what is the society that's supporting that, that, that effort. And I'm a member of that committee. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Compton. Um, thank you. Through the Mayor. I understand that Safe Cup, the airport, you, you're talking about the potential development opportunities there, and I understand you've engaged with um, consultants to look at this. Do members of Safe Cup, the airport, have experience in development of this sort of scale? No, no we don't. Um, and uh, yeah, really, it is about you know, you're highlighting the potential, painting a picture of what's possible, uh, you know, compelling council and others, other key stakeholders. It's not just the council, there's a raft of key stakeholders. Um, you know, to align to drive a process to achieve that outcome, and that would then engage developers. Certainly, I bring an investment perspective, so I um, spend uh, most of my life you know, looking at uh, early stage investment, including um, partnering with investors that have more of a property orientation. But we're, def we're, we're deliberately not bringing you know, a specific you know, property investor lens to this. So we want to paint a bigger picture of what's possible, and should that resonate, then start to. You know, to help uh, you know, stakeholders um, you know, contribute to delivering to that outcome. Perfect. And um, just a follow-up question. Just picking up in the written submission here, uh, you refer to the um, only paved runways within 100 kilometres of Wellington, saying they're uh, unsuitable for heavier aircraft, and this sort of echoes a, a uh, 
a comment that uh, Tim Costley raised last mm -hmm. night around fixed wing yep. aircraft, but Hercules coming in. Um, are you aware that to take off from Carpenter Airport, the aircraft you list there, the Hercules and the C-17 Globemaster would have to be essentially empty to make that? And have you actually assessed the, the other issue, especially the larger C-17 Globemaster, is actually the runway strength itself because it is such a heavy aircraft? The uh, US Department of Defence has downgraded it to about only 600 airfields around the world that it can possibly <laughs> yeah. land at because it's that heavy. And there's been issues with it landing gear breaking because of the potholes, the runways that goes on. So when you, I guess, made that argument, have you looked into the actual cape, you know, the Well, I certainly understand that, you know, the, 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 the runway when it was originally developed was, you know, was high spec because of its, its you know, original purpose. I'm not an airport, you know, runway or aircraft expert. You know, so I would have to talk to other folks. But, uh, um, you know, the, um, in an, an emergency situation, I'd expect that there are, you know, concessions would need to be applied to, you know, to the takeoff and landing envelope and various other factors. So, um, you know, those are, those are issues of detail that, you know, that, that I don't fully, um, you know, have information on. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Councillor Hanford. Kia ora. I just have some kind of background questions around the Carpet Airport Preservation Society and the Save Carpet Airport campaign. How many, roughly how many members do you have of your broader group? I think we've got about 7,000 on the mailing list, so people that are registered to, you know, to, because uh, we've got a website, people can click on that and, and get updates, um, so that's around the rough number. And do you have any kind of understanding of how many of those are from within the Carpety district and how many from outside of the district? And again, on your committee, how many are from inside of Carpety and how many are from outside? Yeah, so um, I wouldn't know if in terms of, you know, there's probably a, a, we haven't asked the question, you know, of the people that are on the, on, on the mailing list. Um, so that there may be a, a privacy issue there anyway. Um, um, but I would expect that, that uh, the vast majority would be from from the region because it's a it's a it's a topic of of local interest. Um, it'd be hard to imagine that uh, you know folks from outside the region would, would engage heavily. There may be others you know that see um, sort of a broader picture of say you know regional uh, airport you know connectivity. So there, there could be some you know that have uh, you know engaged on that basis because the airport is just a stepping stone to another another location by by, by definition. <laughs> Uh, that's what, what 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 an airport you know purpose is. Um, so I'd imagine there's there's folks from that that perspective. So around the uh, around the um, committee, um, there are a number of folks that live uh, from you know from uh, sort of Parramatta North. You know, so uh, um, that's sort of generally the but but most you know most live up up, up here. Councillor Buzzle. Thanks, Marcel, for coming in. And um, I mean, my, my question's kind of around, I know that you've been, your group has been really active and mm. pulling together some really um, bright sparks to, to see and, um, I guess, investigate different options. What's your relationship like with, with the current owners of the airport in terms of facilitating those kind of ideas? Okay. Yeah, well I mean as I said, you know, I respect the current owners, yeah, you know, mandate. I mean I, and uh, just we just have a different view in terms of you know the future. Um, now it'd be great if we could align those views and, and I'd be quite more than happy to engage in those conversations and for for a collective for collective success. Yeah. Um, but that would you know that would require you know a level of you know collaboration and 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 uh, I I don't rule that out. Um, sure. you know, we it's uh, and so I'd say there's, you know, there's respect and understanding. I'm quite happy to meet with, with the owners as part of uh, going forward. But, but you know, I have to sort of make, make the point that you know, our primary focus and my primary focus is to sort of paint a picture of what's possible, mm. sort of engage the community in that conversation. But I'm not necessarily in a position to sort of deliver that outcome. You know, yeah. I've, I've got other things I need to do and it's not necessarily my area of expertise. So it's about sort of catalyzing, I suppose, you know, uh, what I think to, to be a more sustainable and valuable outcome, you know, against a broader set of metrics. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Doesn't seem to... Uh, Councillor Elliot. Um, look, thank you for coming, Marcel. It's great to put a face to the name, finally. Um, Marcel, I'm glad I, you used the word mandate. You spoke about your 85% of people surveyed are in favour mm. of saving the airport, and it was a mandate for you. 
And, you know, funny, with council last time we were in this process, 75% of submitters were in favour of the Gateway project. Mm. Mm. Go figure, but that was the mandate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, we'll be coming out of a, this is our biggest consultation mm. process of the year over many work streams. Is it, do your members understand that when we come out of this, we are going to have a mandate from the public either to save the airport and, or, or, or or, 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 sorry, not say, but, but to be involved in the airport or not. Do, mm. do your members have a good understanding of that concept of our mandate from the public? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's um, I mean, in, in, in the end, we're, re we're respectful of process. In fact, you know, that's why we're engaging in in this process as part of you know achieving a, a particular outcome. Um, you know, we feel strongly about a you know sustainable, viable, long term future. And it's really up to you to, you know, to, to absorb those different perspectives and weigh up, you know, the viability. Um, and uh, and certainly, I respect that. I'm sure the others the others do too. Right. Thank you so much for your time that you've given to on this submission. Thank you, and uh, all the best, everybody. Thank you. Right. Uh, next, submit uh, even fresh water. Kia ora koutou. Um, day three of uh, listening to people talk at you guys. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, even Freshwater, I'm a parent of three boys. I live in the Raumati South. Um, I'm an advocate and a community engagement uh, specialist, I suppose. So I, you know, I like going out and talking to people. Uh, I've got two things I want to talk about today in regards to my submission. The first is... Uh, really around cycling infrastructure and carpety and, and how we can make better connectivity and better use of what we have. And the other thing is um, is looking to discuss a, a multi-use sporting facility uh, here in the in the district that I think is, is pretty imperative. Um, so I'll crack on. Um, I've been a cyclist for years. I've spent three years running the New Zealand Cycle Trail. I was the first, New uh, the first manager, uh, so non-governmental um, manager of the New Zealand Cycle Trail. Uh, it was a fantastic opportunity. It's brought me to Kapiti. Um, the infrastructure I see we have here is really good. The expressway cycle path, the use that that's getting is fantastic. Um, where I see the gaps uh, are in the connectivity between the expressway cycle path and our communities. Um, my boys are 10, 8 and 6 at the moment. They can rattle down footpaths. They're generally fairly careful. But as they get bigger and faster, um, I'm concerned that the current infrastructure we have is going to force them more and more onto roads. The behaviour I see around on the roads isn't filling me with joy and I'd really like to see some more separation between cyclists and vehicles um, and also cyclists and pedestrians. We, we do have an older population here in Kapiti or you know, a relatively old population here in Kapiti that don't enjoy Small kids racing around on bikes, or anyone racing around on bikes, in the same you know in the same bit of real estate that they're trying to walk on. It makes people scared. It makes people nervous. Accidents can happen. People get hurt. If older people get hurt, sometimes that's a death sentence, and I don't want to be responsible for that through my children. So, you know, I I'm aware through my work with the transport agency that the council has been funded to provide for you know as part of the bridleways and cycleways strategy to provide for more connectivity down to the coast from the expressway cycle path and from the ins, you know, from from strategy to strategy I've seen some stuff actually disappear off that and I would really you know, encourage councillors to have a look at what those strategies have been what we've said we were going to do and what we have done and then some of that stuff just seems to have disappeared off subsequent strategies and I don't really understand why and I've not been able to really find out why from people who are working here at council um, so, look, I, I do wave a bit of a cycling flag. I, I am passionate about it. I think it is also you know, one of the reasons we're here in Kapiti is because it's such a great opportunity and such a great place for cycling. Um, yeah, so th there is that. Um, the the multi-use sporting facility... Uh, is that my time? Yeah. <laughs> um, the multi-use sporting facility is, is a... I see that there is... You know, I've talked to a lot of parents who go to various clubs around the place. There is demand. There is expected to be latent demand out there for people to you know, have a facility, have a venue where they can undertake their indoor sports, 
be they martial arts, be they uh, you know, ball sports, be they community activities, um, in fit for purpose venues. I don't see us really having anything like that at this stage in Kapiti. I know there are plans underway, but I also have some reservations about the, um, the some of the plans and the locations of where council is considering putting a multi-use sporting facility in the future, and I'm more than happy to sort of talk to people about that. Um, you know, it's um, We know the population's growing. We know the kids are out there looking for things to do. These clubs are dying to give kids more opportunities, but they don't seem to really have the space or the facility to be able to provide for that. So there's, there's my high horse, and I'd be more than happy to take questions in the time we have. Councillor Compton. Thank you. Through the Mayor, a couple of questions, if I can. In your written um, submission, you talk about uh, not using public money to increase the scope and scale of local school facilities and that these schools have and will block community access. So do you have experience of schools ma blocking access or well, making it difficult, or is it we've, we've seen the, the fact that it's not available during school hours? Thanks for the question. Um, I think where the where the access has been restricted or blocked, in my experience, has been during school time, but also under a fairly tenuous sort of this is school use time, and those hours sometimes get pushed later and later, or there might be you know, over periods of time over years, the school tends to consider that facility more its than the community's, and it becomes more student centric. So student bookings take priority over the community, even though community money got put into that facility for it to be used for everybody. Um, yeah, that would be my experience. It, it, it becomes harder. We would like to have, I'd love to see a facility that people could use during the day, because we know that there are dozens of small venues around town that people are using to a greater or lesser degree of, of, uh, of success. But if we had a, you know, a venue where people could gather and collaborate and work together, it would. where I've seen it work, it's worked very successfully. I spent time in the Rotorua and the, the community recreation and sporting facilities were excellent and really allowed different clubs and different, um, uh, different groups to collaborate and I think that was really pleasant to see and it brought communities together which is also something that I would love to see more of here in Kapiti. Um, thank you and just as a second question, there's uh, Ngā Purupura up in Ōtaki, um, that's a facility that's obviously state of the art and uh, huge court facilities there. What other barriers for, do you see for people um, down the southern end of the coast accessing that or why do you not oh, why would people not be using that as when much? I've when I've talked to people about going to Otaki and using that facility, there some groups have been told point blank that they're not welcome in there and I, I'm not clear about the ownership but I don't believe it's a council owned facility. So it does again restrict if it's council owned, if it's owned by us, then we get to you know the community gets to you know discuss how they want to see it used. And again, that's something that I've, you know, as, a, as an engagement specialist, I love, I love working with people to find ways to utilise a resource. Thank you. Thank you. Good. good afternoon, Evan. Um, good thanks for coming along and speaking to your submission. Um, given your comments just around, or your particular interest around cycling, I was just curious about whether you had um, participated in our um, sustainable transport strategy and submitted on it and so forth. It was within the last 12 months, I think. I was familiar, I was aware of the strategy. I don't know if I submitted. I, you might know better than no, I, do. Right. I, I, I do. I don't know if I submitted. I read, but yeah, I can't remember. Oh, okay, it's just it's helpful for us to know with people that are passionate about a particular area. Mm. We've had considerable comments about public transport, for example, yes. and people come here, but the reality is Greater Wellington deliver it. And so it's, um, I guess this is helpful, those comments are pointed in the right direction at the right sure. time. So I appreciate you coming along though. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Randall. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, my question relates to council controlled organisations. Are you aware of um, any research that's been undertaken to see whether they are financially viable? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it, in the discussions, I've, I've had discussions with a bunch of people around this, this long term plan. And a family friend of ours is an accountant. His last role before he went into private practice was working through uh, for a consultancy, basically looking at every council in New Zealand, every council-controlled organisation in New Zealand. And they found that 
when you actually looked at the reality of those organisations, very few of them were um, financially successful. Some, you know, some were viable to varying degrees, but it seemed to be a lot more complex. Uh, and once this, once his, once they started undertaking these audits and moving beyond the the council face of these are really successful they started having some reservations around the success. So I, I didn't dig any further into that, but if anyone was interested, I'm always happy to put you in touch with the, per the individual uh, concerned, and he could probably provide some uh, significant clarity around that work that he did. Thank you. Councillor Buzzell. Councillor Jocelyn. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you even very much for coming along and speaking today. So Councillor Buswell and I, we're actually, uh, we sit on the CWB and that's made up of a, a range of CWB users including the cycling fraternity. And I'm just wondering whether you're actually part of any cycling group that actually feeds into that to, um, you know, to actually, so that some of your concerns are actually, um, you know, <coughs> hopefully being addressed? Um, I, I don't have time to do that anymore. Uh, with, with three boys, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of sporting groups, and they take a lot of time, uh, but I haven't been involved in any cycling organisations since I left the cycle trail. OK, well, maybe after we can have a bit of a chat. Love to. Um, thank you. Councillor Buzzell. My exact questions. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I was just going to tell you about the, um, the CWB advisory group, which is... Um, which is really key to that, um, I guess, that action on the ground as to how um, the CWB works and functions and, um, and, and trails of interest and, um, and work, works going forward. So sure. um, I'd be really interested to talk to you about specific tracks that you believe have perhaps been taken off the strategy that were there previously, um, and then we can certainly take that back to um, the advisory group and have a look and, and see what's happened there. So sure. um, yeah, again, um, as Jocelyn said, it would be great to, to catch up with you and um, and see whether you can even contribute to, to our group in some look, I'd, way. I'd love, to, I'd love to make the time. My, yeah. my interactions with council have, have usually been at a council officer level, uh, right. and also during my time officially with the New Zealand Cycle Trail. Um, and then subsequent to that as a, as a resident here. So it's, it's been at an officer level rather than a yeah. strategic level more than yeah. anything. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holiday. Good afternoon. Good Good afternoon. Uh, look, um, I think you've already actually answered my question, but um, when we met last was uh, at a meeting uh, with regards to various other groups who are also very much interested in the space. I'm just wondering, I just haven't really heard much in regards to that group. Uh, did that form into a group to move that conversation forward around the indoor sports centre, or we we've had we've had other meetings, and when it came down to it, if there's no if we don't have the ability to undertake a feasibility study, people's time is valuable. It's hard for us to get people together on the promise that we may or may not be able to get some money to see if this is actually going to go anywhere. So it's it, it, that was the challenge, and we always came up against that. So if the opportunity it comes about that we can, yeah, we can go to people and say, there is the opportunity for a feasibility study here. Uh, then we really get to know whether or not this is something which is valuable to the community or not. That's more than fair enough, and I do mm. apologise that we haven't caught up for that coffee yet. No, I'll do that soon. Katie. That leads right into my question. Good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon. So would you support funding going into the long-term plan for a feasibility study? I would love to see funding going into the long-term plan for a feasibility study into a community Great. sports venue. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Elliot. Yeah, thank you so much. Great to <laughs> talk to you again um, about the subject. So I'm really glad that you are in need of funding for a feasibility study, and that's something that we've um, now got that we can start working with with the paperwork. <coughs> I've got here an email from 2018 when um, your, the group last submitted on an LTP and it included your um, Capity Vision uh, Community Multisports. Indeed. So I take it if that's up to date, I will then forward that out as background information to the decision makers here. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, is that all right? Is that still up to date? It's as, as up to date as it, as it needs to be at the stage, so that will work well. Fantastic, okay. There seems to be an end to those questions. Come Thank on. you very much for taking the time and talking Thank to us. Thank you very us. much indeed. Thank you. Appreciate it.
the next emitter, Carbury Chamber of Commerce, Sam Pritchard. Welcome. Thank you. Kia ora, Kaur Sam Pritchard, Toko Unua. I'm here representing the Kapiti Chamber of Commerce today. So the Kapiti Chamber of Commerce represents over 300 business people in Kapiti. Um, we believe there's huge opportunities for growth within the district, but this must be done in a, um, in a managed way, sustainably, um, both financially sustainably and environmentally sustainably. Um, and council need to have a customer-focused um, approach to enable this to happen. And by doing that, they need to have... Um, to create business confidence in the, in the council itself and within the region. Uh, we also believe that council procurement policy should be weighted to ensure it supports local businesses as much as possible. We know it's not um, always the case, but where, where possible would be great. Um, and the chamber is also happy to collaborate closely with the council to assist with the planned growth of, and the opportunities that come with that. And we believe that strong business within Kapiti creates strong communities. Um, so I'm just keeping it short and simple, given that it's four o'clock on a, um, what day is it, Wednesday. Um, so yeah, happy to take questions, so thank you. Questions? Waiting, waiting, waiting. Rob McCann, Councillor McCann. Kia ora. Um, with the housing portfolio hat on, I noticed you, noticed you said that we shouldn't take a, a, a bigger role in housing. One of the questions and the discussion we've often had is that people perceive that to mean that we shouldn't, uh, when they answer no, they're often meaning that we shouldn't become a housing developer. Do you see the fact that uh, there is a great deal of work uh, that can be done by council that actually isn't being a housing developer but actually means that we are effectively trying to influence the market which yeah, I think I think the question around the role is the definition of what the role council should have, and council definitely have a role in, in housing in the community. I don't believe, um, and um, I speak for the chamber, we don't believe the council should be developing houses. I think that's more of a central government role, but council definitely have a role in, in reducing regulation and helping zoning and, and supply of land. So um, I absolutely agree with you there, which is irrelevant, but <laughs> um, the second part of that question that I'll ask now is that with the housing continuum, you see on the left-hand side of that, you've got emergency housing, social housing, affordable housing, and it moves all the way along. That um, process in the free market has not worked. And you'll see it at the right-hand side, we're developing nice big houses and plenty of them, but we're not developing affordable housing, social housing, emergency housing. Do you see council's role in trying to rectify that, not, as you say, be a developer, as something that we should be doing? Again, I believe that's a supply issue. The more, the more land you provide, the more options the market will provide. So it'll provide the emergency housing and the, the rental. Can I challenge you on that by asking yep. another question then? Do you think there is more money for developers to be made by providing the housing on the right-hand side of that spectrum, the larger houses, the big boxes, as opposed to the social housing, affordable housing, emergency housing? It depends on the model. So I think, I think generally speaking, yes. But you know, there's, a, there's numerous shared equity, rent-to-buy models. A lot of um, iwi groups are coming to the party um, with developers on that, in that space. So, so if, yeah. if, the, if the market pushes developers towards one thing, do you not, which is the, the bigger box housing, do you not think that council should try and play a role for a big part of our community that is struggling to encourage developers to participate in the development of the three things that I've been talking about? Again, I see the market. Um, if, if it was um, financially rewarding for the market, then the I provide those houses. So you are now agreeing that it's probably not financially rewarding, therefore we probably need to play a role if we want to develop that? If you want to develop different models or, or financially rewarding developers to provide those models? Yeah. I, I'm already, uh, I can hear the murmurings of the word debate, but it's really interesting <laughs> to, to have that discussion because it has been, it has been very useful to hear people's uh, reasons for, for opposing that all being for it, but thank you for that. I think there's huge opportunity to, to cater for the, the range of the housing continuum product um, and working with, I think I mentioned iwi and developers, credible developers. By playing a bigger role. Oops, did I say that? 
<laughs> Council um, holidays. Well, I think that's a central government role. But. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for um, coming in and for your presentation, Sam. I actually have a uh, question here from uh, Councillor Compton, who's, who's currently representing us to the Greater Wellington Regional Council submission process. Uh, but he wanted to ask me, given the airport is a member of the Chamber, did the Chamber discuss their planned survey on the airport with the current owners before they conducted it? I don't know, Chris, did you get <laughs> consulted with? Uh, no. No, so I think we missed the opportunity. Um, Chris has offered to come and speak to the board, and we are inviting him to come to the next board meeting. Um, but um, I think there was a better opportunity for collaboration and, and um, with the airport with, Thank in you. regard to that survey. Yeah. And the question I had, uh, talking about collaboration, look, I note that you're a key stakeholder with regards to economic development strategy, and I asked this of Kita the other night, um, are you happy, or how's the collaboration going in regards to your relationship with KCDC through that process? I oh, think we are now. Um, the economic development team have been great under Darren Grant and Liana, and we've had some quite good engagement, especially during COVID. I think we co-hosted a number of um, webinars during lockdown and post-lockdown. Um, I, um, uh, yeah, we've we've set up a, um, a monthly meeting with the ED team, so I think it has been really good, and they were keen to um, work with us further. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Council Buzzle. Thanks, Sam, for coming in today. Um, I was actually just going to touch on um, the COVID recovery um, item as well, and in respect of how um, you worked so closely with council in delivering um, to our community. You know, what, what was that like, and, um, and did your members and did the wider community benefit from that? Um, yes, they did. We had, um, I think everyone was going a bit crazy for webinars during that period, so we had some of our biggest um, numbers turn up to those webinars. And I think uh, I wasn't personally involved, but the ED team were really good to work with. Um, so it, it was well supported. That's great to hear because um, throughout the submission process, we've had a little bit of a criticism in terms of, um, of the council's response to recovery. And I think that the key there was actually working alongside um, groups that were on the ground and were working with some pretty um, distraught business owners and communities out there, so um, it's great to hear that your communication between council and yourselves was really strong in, um, in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That's um, much appreciated. Thank you for coming and presenting your submission. Okay, thank you for your time. Next, Samita, Wellington Living Street. Eileen Blake. Welcome. Uh, kia ora tātou, um, ko Alan Blake ahau, ko Kaituitui, Whanganui Atara ki a Living Streets Aotearoa. Um, so I'm with Living Streets, a pedestrian advocacy group, and we are part of a big Wellington group that kind of covers, we try and cover anyway the whole Wellington region, so that's why I'm here today. Um, we yeah, so we try to get more people walking more often is basically our mantra um, because it's healthy, it's social and it's really good for the communities and your economic um, business. People walk to shops. Um, so I just wanted to come and say that, um, you know, it's good on Kapiti District for declaring a climate emergency in 2019. It's really important that we take action on that. The Climate Change Commission has um, come up with some targets of that we're supposed to meet for to meet our re emissions reduction, including a 25% walk mode increase. We're expecting the new planning laws to um, have a focus on making more livable places, so they need to be more walkable. So with, with that kind of background, what I we um, would like to ask is that the um, proposed Paraparaumu Link Road project is canned, and that significant amount of money is redistributed to um, footways and footpaths program, which is quite a, only 4.6 million in there at the moment, and also to the um, transformation of the revoked State Highway 1 um, work, which I see is happening down the road at the moment. It looks like there's some footpath going in there. It needs to go all the way through. Um, and what we ask for, for that is that it's done well and done once. Um, I think if you go to um, 
the hut, you can see that they're still struggling with some of that revocation stuff from Ferguson Drive, even all these years later. Ferguson Drive in the hut has the same number of cars on it now as it did before River Road went in. So, um, and, but it's also got one quite good model that um, about the kind of thing I'm talking about here is um, I've just come out off the train from Wellington and gone underneath the road to get into a car park to find my way here. No, no wayfinding at all. But um, the hut is, upper hut station's got a really cool new redevelopment outside their railway station where um, they made a much nicer place when you come off the train and it's very welcoming. It's got some nice art stuff, you know, nice planting like you've got across the road here. And it just was a really um, good opportunity to make that place much better. So part of why, why we say can that road, apart from its climate impacts, is you, this, this is a, use that money to have a really good opportunity for making some of these places um, in the Kapiti better. And one of the things that um, I'm particularly keen on is that we also uh, make places safer for people walking, which is one of the reasons we don't support shared paths. But today, um, this week is actually Road Safety Week, and I was at a thing today at Parliament um, talking about road safety, and particularly for children around schools. So the message is that what we need is 30 kilometre an hour zones um, and it says streets for life mean slower speeds around school. So that's another really good place to put some of that money that you avoid spending on a high emitting road um, and put it into some other worthwhile projects. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Kutz. Ellen, thanks for coming along today and speaking to our long term plan submission. Um, you had mentioned the work that had happened. Um, down the Ramadi Straits and you could see the work that is done there, which is the revocation plans for M to PP. Were you involved in the process feeding into those plans? And if so, have you seen the designs for that, um, the actual pathway and, uh, and cycleway that we've been highly criticised for, extending all the way through to the north? Were um, you involved in that part of the process? No, we haven't been involved in that. Okay. I know you've got some good staff on council, like Bruce um, Johnson, who's pretty onto all of those sort of things. So. Okay, thank you. Councillor Holliday. Um, Matt actually answered that question um, as well. Look, I just want to check, um, although you weren't involved in the process, have you actually seen the revocation plan for around the railway station area at all? No, I haven't. Okay, no, we just, we've had... I, but we've, no, we've noticed $6 million won't buy you very much in um, any, any road transport project. No, it's just that um, yeah. there's quite a beautification process going on, and that plus is a tabletop. Uh, pedestrian crossing uh, mm. on, above that uh, mm. underground. So that's, that's really good stuff. Yep. That's good stuff, that's all right. Um, also, I was just interested in your views around um, you don't support shared pathways. What's the no. reasoning behind that? Um, but these, shared paths are designed for um, with cycl cycling in mind, and we find that um, pedestrians don't enjoy sharing um, space with fast moving vehicles. So that's bikes, but also now um, we're seeing e scooters. Um, it particularly makes older people feel unsafe, and so when you feel unsafe, you won't you won't go out and use some of those facilities because they they don't feel right for you, um, and so they are designed for mostly for cycling. The one along the um, the highway, the new one out here, is just kind of a long straight, or well, with a few wiggles um, path. Nice nice green stuff, so that's quite quite good. But if you've got that much space, make it do what we, it's best practice to have separated. Um, Facilities, and I think, as far as I understand, cyclists don't like those sort of places either. If you're out there walking your dog, um, you don't want to have to keep it, you know, right next to you. If you've got your children out there, you don't want to have to be watching out for people zooming past. Um, it's going to be a more significant issue, particularly if we get to be successful and get more people cycling, um, which we want to do. So, the the idea is to, as I said before, do it once, do it right, um, use best practice, and do separation. I know there's um, quite a lot of wide roads around Kapiti. I think there's plenty of space um, to, especially on the state highway, uh, you know, plenty of space to to do that best practice. Um, taking that on board, and thank you very much, um, but uh, we do have our shared pathways at the moment, but um, I'm just curious, it's been discussed to have a, um, a like a ic ic um, ic uh, I've lost the word. Uh, not equity, um, uh, etiquette, uh, etiquette uh, oh, program with regards to uh, cyclists and how they interact with uh, people on the uh, in the shared pathway. 
Um, do you believe that would be effective at all um, no. or of use? No, it's, it's not effective anywhere else. I don't see why it would be here. I think the road rules are the things that we should um, follow. You know, you don't go ringing your bell, zooming past people on the road. You get a different, quite a different reaction if you, but if, you know, on the shared path, it doesn't work either. Thanks for coming in today. I just wanted to go back to the um, the revocation because obviously it's an experience that you've just recently had. Um, and you're um, you're mentioning that there was a six million dollar in the budget for um, for that. Well, um, were you aware that NZTA pay for a lot yes. of a lot of that? Yes. So six million budget might seem little, but actually we're getting quite a bit of bang for buck because it's not all our money that we're using. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, and sorry, we we have been involved in some of this. We, we came to a, a couple of workshops. I just remembered um, up at Waikanae and here. Um, feels like years ago. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Elaine, for coming and presenting your submission to us. Thanks for Much giving me the time. Thank you. Next, Michael. Tenakotu, um, good afternoon. Thanks for hearing me. Um, all I wanted to do this afternoon was uh, briefly emphasise the two points I was attempting to make in my written submission. And this is a personal submission. I'm a member of the Safe Capital Airport Society and the Aero Club, but this is my own personal um, submission. The first point I was trying to make was that the intent of private plan change 73, um, that be continued into the long-term plan, um, and that, by that I mean that development, around, that, that development around an operating airport with a little of the development put aside to support the airport be permitted. And the reason for that is um, if there was going to be a change to that, um, for example, the airport was going to be closed and the entire site permitted for residential development, it would have to be subjected to the rigorous scrutiny of another private plan change. So your council officers and your advisors would then be able to support the council with the detailed information you need to um, make the best decision for Kapiti as a whole. So that was really the first point I was making. Um, and I think this is important and it's justified because just from my looking at it, there seems to be plausible alternatives to simply closing the airport and permitting commercial residential development. About 55% of the area, that's about 70 hectares, can be developed for non-aviation purposes and that's conservative. Um, that sort of development could be aligned with funded Crown investment programs, which are the Kainga or a Strategic Land Purchase Program, the Housing Acceleration Fund, the Residential Development Response Fund, and on top of that you've got any um, treaty settlement funds. Um, that could enable purchase of the entire site by negotiation by the, <coughs> by the Crown. Retaining a reduced airport as an enabler, and uh, quality and visionary housing development that Capity would really feel proud of. So that, that's why I think it's important to um, keep the airport open so we've got time to make decisions carefully. Um, so the second thing is that I'm, so I'm submitting to the long-term plan process that does Capity District Council have a role in the future of the airport? And I'm asking yes. Um, and its role is to have the Economic Development Committee investigate options so that the decision can be reached, whatever what you know, an informed decision can be reached, whatever that is. So that was really the point of my submission. Questions? Thank you. Questions? Councillor Holiday. Uh, thank you, uh, three, Mr. Chair. Look, just reading your uh, submission here, it says um, with the airport it is their plan to close the airport for intensive development of unsustainable housing to maximise short-term private gain. Um, I was just wondering if you'd been privy to any information that, um, well, I haven't been, uh, with regards to the future plans of the airport owners. No, look, all I know is what I've read in the media, councillor. So if there's a change to that, I'd be really, really pleased. But yeah, so I've got no special insight information. There doesn't appear to be any other questions. Thank you very much for coming and presenting your submission. Thank you. And if you've got my sympathy, three days of this, well done. <laughs> Thank you. The next submitter, um, 
Barry Stimson. Welcome. Now, it only takes about 30 seconds, so I'll stop the time. Good afternoon. I'm talking about the Waikanae swimming pool, that it be a summertime picnic pool facilities need to be upgraded. My submission is that the existing dressing rooms have been have new showers and toilet cubicles, vanity tops, basins and mirrors. New facilities for disabled, staff room and entrance lobby be similar to those at the Power Pram Aquatic Centre. Also in the 20 year plan, a new Waikanae Aquatic Centre with a roof similar to a tacky pool. This aquatic centre could be located off Park Avenue near Somerset Village or further north ad adjacent to a future Waikanae College. I'll answer questions if there's any. Council Cooks. Afternoon, thanks for coming and speaking to us with your ideas around the Waikanae Pool. I'm actually the Ōtaki Ward Councillor, however I have taken my kids to the Waikanae Pool. Are you aware that one of the attractions or pop reason for its popularity is the nature of it being an open pool um, through the summer season and so forth? It sort of adds to the mix of our pool offerings in Kapiti? Yes, I'm aware of that, and that's my reason for stating that it would be a summertime pool, a picnic pool, and the facilities just need to be upgraded. I'm not talking about upgrading the the pool itself or the pump room. I uh, might have misheard you because I thought you had said having it covered like the Ōtaki pool. Uh, you're right, but that's the next one. The 20 year one, this yeah. one I'm asking that it be renovated within five years. The other one with the roof is a brand new complex. I'm not looking for a ward ruining roof like at Power Pram. I'd Fair like enough. an award winning facility, not an award winning roof. Any other questions? Michael, oh, Councillor Holbrook. Sorry, thank you for your, for your uh, submission today. I think it's a great idea. Um, can you tell us about these plans that you've passed around? Where do they, where, where do they come from? What are they? Uh, could you repeat the last part of that? So where did, what, what are these plans? Could you just tell us about them? I drew that. You drew them? Yeah. I got the um, plans search done. You're aware the the facility is 50 years old, approximately, first built by the Horofanua Council, and there's been very little done to the changing room. They they changed the chicken netting around the the ventilation space and put plastic, and that's about all that's happened. And in, as I'm aware. Uh, the other point is the um, choke point in the um, entry lobby. Um, as you're aware, there's a lot of um, people come from a picnic and they bring chili bins and all the other, plus children, and the um, existing lobby is inadequate. Yeah, it's very small. Have you been to the community board with these ideas? No. Right. Thank you very much for coming today. Okay. Councillor Holiday. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, and thank you for coming in, Baron. Thank you very much for doing these plans, because it's a really good um, idea of this. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're a regular user of the port at some stage, or still are? Yeah, about five days a week, either here, Otaki, or 
power plant or why can I when it's open? And from your opinion, you know, you've obviously that these are areas. If you talk to staff down there as well, and you, these are things that you uh, envision are what we need down in there. Just small modifications, so to speak. Yes, I'm not suggesting any work on the pool. Uh, I get good help from the um, lifeguards, and I use a hoist to get in and out of the pool. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you very much for these plans. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you very much for coming and presenting your submission. Much appreciated. Thank you. Could we um